Welcome to Massey Dialogue. Bienvenue. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers and I'm the principal of Massey College. I want to acknowledge that Massey College is built on Indigenous lands, lands that have been occupied and inhabited by Indigenous people for thousands of years. It is the land of the Huron-Wanda, the Seneca, the Mississaugas of the Credit. It is a treaty land of the Mississaugas of the Credit, and I want to acknowledge our duty to, of stewardship toward this land and the great privilege that we have to do our work here. Today is a wonderful dialogue. I'm really excited about it, and I know you all are. We are so delighted to have among us Dr. Afua Cooper, who will be uh, speaking as we begin Black History Month at Massey College about a topic that I cannot wait to hear, sugar, codfish, enslaved Africans, and the founding of a Canadian university. To introduce her and to enter into a dialogue, Greg Kelly, the executive producer of CBC Ideas, a great partner of Massey College for the Massey Lectures, is here with us today. So without further ado, Greg. Well, thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Natalie, uh, and it's good to see you again in these strange times. It's my uh, privilege and pleasure to be uh, introducing and then talking with uh, Dr. Afwa Cooper, or Afwa, as I've come to know her. Um, she's been a regular presence uh, over the last few years on ideas, particularly one series I recall uh, with uh, with uh, astonishment on uh, slavery in Canada uh, pre Confederation Canada, and then the legacy of slavery post-Confederation. And um, uh, uh, it's common for moderators in this situation to say, needs no introduction. And probably Dr. Cooper doesn't, but here it is anyhow, because I think um, it helps give context to the, what's going to be following here. A conversation between uh, Afua Cooper. She will, of course, do um, a presentation um, uh, after I'm uh, finished introducing her. And then there'll be a conversation with a, a few people that will be led by um, Remy Warner, who's a Massey College Senior Fellow and the Director of the Human Rights Services uh, at uh, what used to be called Ryerson University. So Afua Cooper is a multidisciplinary scholar, author, and artist. Her 13 books range across history, poetry, fiction, and children's literature, her indomitable research on slavery and black history in particular has made her one of the leading figures in African Canadian studies and an authority on Canadian slavery. Her books on Canadian slavery, The Hanging of Angelique, The Untold Story of Slavery in Canada, and The Burning of Old Montreal broke new ground in the study of the Canadian and Atlantic uh, slave trade. She is a fellow of the Warren Center for Studies in American History at Harvard University. Dr. Cooper led uh, the university's Studying Slavery Initiative at Dalhousie University and was the lead author of the subsequent report, Lord Dalhousie's History on Slavery and Race. These initiatives revealed the connections between the Canadian Academy and the Atlantic slaving systems. In 2021, <coughs> pardon me, Professor Cooper was appointed as the Canadian representative for UNESCO's International Scientific Committee Slavery Project, whose main objective is to conduct research on the transatlantic slavery system and its legacies. Additionally, she is the principal investigator for A Black People's History of Canada, a $1 million Canadian Heritage Funded project. A celebrated poet in 2020, Dr. Cooper was awarded the Portia White Prize, Nova Scotia's highest recognition for the arts. She is also the winner of the J.M. Abraham Atlantic Poetry Award for her poetry book, Black Matters. Afua Cooper holds the Killam Research Chair at Dalhousie University in Halifax, where she teaches. Afua, after that, I'm afraid we're out of time, given the list of <laughs> distinctions. That I'm, I'm kidding, of course. I will turn it over to you right now, and we'll rejoin uh, the two of us for a conversation in a few minutes. Thank you, Greg. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, uh, Principal De Rosier and the entire team at Massa College um, for this wonderful introduction. I usually begin with an acknowledgement to the African ancestors. So I acknowledge the African ancestors. I honor them. It's because of their struggles that I'm here. Um, my personal ancestors and millions of other ancestors survived the Atlantic crossing, that horrific crossing called the Middle Passage. Um, to the Americas where they were enslaved. It's through their resilience, their struggles for freedom that I can breathe free air. So I acknowledge the ancestors. I 
want to talk about Dalhousie's university's imbrication with the Atlantic slave trade. And it is because of the Atlantic slave trade um, that Dalhousie University came into existence. You know, we often do not think um, that Canadian universities are somehow involved with slavery and the slave trade. We often um, know more about the American context, but certainly uh, Canadian universities, in this case, my university on the East Coast, was very, very much involved with the Atlantic slaving system. My, my um, theme, my title is Sugar Codfish Enslaved Africans and the Founding of a Canadian University. And it speaks really to the economic connections, the commercial links between the Maritimes Canada and you know even Upper and Lower Canada, but I'll confine my comments to Maritimes Canada, speaks to the economic and commercial links between Maritimes Canada, in this case, Nova Scotia, and um, the slave colonies of the West Indies, especially the Anglo, the Anglo colonies, the the French and and, and Dutch colonies were also involved. Um, these places were called the foreign West Indies in in the parlance of the day. Brazil was also involved. Maritime um, uh, captains and merchants uh, traded with Brazil too. And when you look at some of the the trustees and governors of Dalhousie University and also King's College University or sister institution, you'll see that many of them were West India, West India trade merchants. Um, and that's how they made their fortune. Now, the West India trade, when we speak of a West India merchant, it's not necessarily someone who was a West Indian or lived or was born in the West Indies. It speaks to a merchant or a businessman whose main trading endeavor was with the West Indies. And that trading endeavor, what undergirded that endeavor was slavery and the slave trade. It was enslaved Africans who toiled in on, on the plantations that created the the that grew the products, the sugar cane that was turned into molasses, into rum, and and into sugar that was exported up to the 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 coast, up to the Atlantic coast, you know, and across the Atlantic to to all points of the world, and in exchange for from the Atlantic or the maritime colonies. Uh, dried fish, herring, cod, um, mackerel, salted beef, salted pork, timber, um, timber that was and stays that was used to build the barrels and the pails and the casks. Even horses and cattle were exported down to the, the West Indies. So, in fact, it was um, maritime products and also products from, from New England that, as one scholar, Eric Kimball notes, built the, sla the slavery infrastructure in the West Indies. So this um, commercial connection was undergirded by slavery. In fact, the main source of protein for the enslaved Africans who toiled in the West Indies, the main source of protein was dried cod. And, and it was the worst cut of the cod, by the way. The, the, the better uh, cuts of cod were exported to Britain and to the Mediterranean. So the enslaved people got the, the worst cut of cod, but nonetheless, it formed the main protein source. And to this day, the national dish of Jamaica, believe it or not, is codfish and ackee. Ackee is a, a, a vegetable that's grown in, in tropical countries. The national dish, is, is cod and aki. We call it saltfish in Jamaica. Cod is not, cod doesn't swim in the Caribbean waters. You have to head up in the North Atlantic for cod. So the, the, the national dish speaks to the afterlife of slavery. So let's, um, Dalhousie was founded as a result of the Castine Fund. And we'll, we'll just keep spinning the slide. Now, what is the Castine Fund? The Castine Fund consisted of trade taxes charged on imports entering Castine, Maine during the British occupation of Castine, Maine from 1814, September 1814 to April 1815. Of these taxes, 30% came from slave-grown goods imported from the West Indies. 
No casting was this little poor town in Maine. And during the War of 1812, um, the, the British and Canadian uh, militia from Halifax sailed down to, to Maine, captured several cities or towns, including the port of Castine. And the port of Castine was involved in the West India trade. Now, when the British captured the War of 1812 between Britain and the United States, when the British from Halifax captured Castine, they seized the custom house and every ship that came in and out of, um, you know, had to pay duties at the custom house. So when the war ended and the British and Canadians finally sailed from Castine in April of 1815, they took with them the, the pot of money, close to 11,000 11, pounds that they collected at Castine, sailed up to Halifax. The money sat there until Lord Dalhousie arrived um, from the UK as governor of Nova Scotia. And he eventually used the uh, monies from the Castine Fund to endow Dalhousie University, which became known at the time was Dalhousie College. So this revenue made possible the endowment of the, of the college from 1818 to 1823. Um, and over 9,000 pounds came from the Castine Fund for that purpose. And we'll, we'll just switch on to the, the next slide. And between 1819 and 1823, the province, as it states there in the, in, in the slide, the province of Nova Scotia grant, gave grants and a loan to the university to shore up its en endowment. Now, the province, also depended on the West India trade. Um, many, many of the incoming ships that were coming in from, in from the West Indies and had to pay their tax at the port of Halifax were coming from the West Indies. They were importing the sugar, um, the rum, the molasses, the cocoa, and the coffee. And so um, they had to pay their, their, their taxes at the, the custom port. And it's from um, that pool of money, that monies were also ex given to Dalhousie University, as I said, a grants and a loan to shore up the endowment of the college. The monies from the Castine Fund, and we'll uh, keep going. Um, in today's money, um, as um, my um, distinguished colleague, Dr. Shirley Tillotson, um, did the math on this, would be about a million, um, the building costs would be uh, uh, in today's money over $1 million. And there it, it's all broken down how the, the money from the Castine, what was spent uh, from the college to, for the college's endowment the, and the money from the assembly that was um, given to the college to make sure that it its existence would be assured. So, the I, I thought I indicated earlier on that the West India trade was this import export endeavor in which the merchants of the colonies traded um, salted products, salted uh, fish products, timber, lumber, and so on. Nova Scotia was integrated into the global economy through this trade from 1777 to 1840. This was Nova Scotia's most important trade relationship. And it wasn't just in the English period or the British period of colonial history that the West Indies trade or the West India trade was important. It was also important during the French period. When you look at Ile Royale, what is now Cape Breton, the, the, which was a French colony and other and in other um, francophone parts of what became Canada, the, this trade with the West Indies was crucial. So we, we will continue. Now, the, it rested on the bodies of enslaved people, of enslaved Africans in the West Indies. As I said here, um, this trade was underpinned by the commerce in kidnapped African bodies and the labor wrung from these bodies to produce colonial and imperial wealth. Without these monies from the West India trade, we would not have Dalhousie or uh, maybe not at the time then that we had it. It would have evolved if someone had the vision and someone fundraised the money. Um, 
But the fact of the matter is that it owes its existence to the West India trade. Halifax was a port city, but Halifax was not the only port city in Nova Scotia or in the Maritime. St. Saint John, New Brunswick was important. St. John's, Newfoundland was important, you know, for the, all the Atlantic provinces. In Nova Scotia itself, smaller um, ports, Lunenburg, uh, Port Greville, Parsborough, um, all across the, the, the the, the coastal areas of Nova Scotia and, and Cape Breton. They were ports that were heavily involved with the West Indies trade. They were entire communities that fished cod, that dried cod, that were sent down to the West Indies to feed the enslaved people. And um, sugar and its products would come up to these places. So you'd have on the table of poor people, ordinary people, um, molasses, sugar, some of these people may never have seen a West India plantation or a West Indian plantation, but there they were consuming the products of, um, that were grown by enslaved people. Here is an ad um, put in a Halifax newspaper, the Halifax Gazette, very early, 1752, by a West Indian merchant by the name of Joshua Major, and he brought up enslaved people from the Caribbean and was selling them in Halifax. He brought them up on his ship. So it wasn't only the sugar and the molasses and the coffee that was um, that were imported and sold at these maritime ports, but people, human beings, enslaved people were also sold at different points all across the, the maritime provinces and also in the colony of Newfoundland. And so there it is, there you, you have it. We'll, con we'll continue with the slides. Now, the, the, this is a, an important slide. Here's Cronan's Wharf in Halifax. And there you'll see the, the, the storehouses, but you'll see barrels, you'll see the cask, you'll see pails on the wharf itself. And it's, it's, these um, items here are very important because in these barrels that were made of the staves um, from, from the forest of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, in these barrels were sent the, the cod and the herring and the pork and the beef and the flour and so on to the West Indies. We'll move to the next slide because it connects. Here again, we have these barrels, these casks, and in this case, there's sugar, wet sugar, molasses being shipped from the colony of Antigua. There they are being put on this boat and there are the two ships waiting in the harbor. And these barrels of sugar will be exported to perhaps Nova Scotia, to the UK, to New England. So, you know, to Newfoundland. And chances are the, the, the timber, the staves that were used to make these barrels at Cronan's Wharf and here in Antigua, as mentioned, came from the forests in Nova Scotia and in New Brunswick. So there were so many interconnections um, between the maritime colonies and the West Indian slave uh, plantations, the West Indian slave colonies, and also with the British Isles and farther afield, the Mediterranean to West Africa, to where the enslaved people were coming from. So oftentimes when people say, oh, there was no slavery in Canada, which was not true, there was internal slavery in Canada. But if you look at it um, from a global perspective, you will see how you know, the Canadians were very much involved in the global trade, in the global commerce that pertained to um, slavery and the slave trade. Let's, let's move on. Here it's, I state that Nova Scotia imported 90% of its sugar from the West Indies. This was also true for rum and molasses. Nova Scotian, and as, as emancipation happened in the British West Indies, April, um, August 1st, 1834, enslaved 
abolition happened, emancipation happened, uh, the slaves were legally really released from slavery. Nova Scotian merchants began importing the bulk of their sugar and rum products from the French and Spanish slave colonies and from Brazil. So they just look elsewhere in the West Indies. And this nexus, this nexus between sugar and slavery, the maritime colonies and the Hose University was strengthened even more, even after the emancipation of slavery in the British West Indies. Let's keep going. It's important to have this image here because it was human beings, it was black people, enslaved Africans and their descendants who were producing this sugar. So here uh, you know, are some men and, and there's a woman and, and children um, cultivating sugar. And there's an overseer in the, in the background. Oftentimes we don't realize that sometimes when, when you know, people then consumed sugar, when they put sugar in their tea or their coke or coffee, or in as they, you know, in the, the recipe for, for, for making pudding, let's say, or, or cakes, that they were actually consuming the blood of black people. Because the, you have the overseer there. He is the, the person in whom terror is embodied because he has the whip. And sometimes when they would whip these people, blood would run down their bodies and their blood would, you know, literally fertilize the cane fields. But even as the canes were harvested and were milled, were taken to the, the mills and the, the, the juice wrung out of them, sometimes the hands of the enslaved people who were manning the mill would get caught in the mill and would be and had to be cut off and that blood and human flesh would be grounded up in in this in the in the wet sugar in the molasses and and the process would continue and that would be exported and people wouldn't realize that the blood of slaves were actually part of the molasses and of the sugar so it's important some of times when we theorize but we have to know that was people who were making these products and they paid with their blood, sweat and tears. Let's move on. Some these are names of some of the West Indian merchants, Samuel Connard, we all know who he is, William Rush, Joseph Salter, James and Michael Tobin, Mather Biles Allman and Enos Collins. Collins was reputed to be the Briti richest man in British North America when he died. And I'll just talk about briefly Mather Biles Allman. Alman was from the celebrated Alman and Johnston family, a family in, in Nova Scotia that was, you know, involved in shipping, in, in, in banking, in academia, and in politics. Mather Biles Alman was a trustee at Dalhousie University, and he was also a trustee at King's College University. And he made his fortune or his family uh, made their fortune from the West India trade. They were involved in the West Indian trade. And I also want to say that with capital earned from the West India trade, uh, people like Alman were able to diversify into, into other endeavors. So he was one of the founders of the Bank of Nova Scotia. So when you have um, surplus cap capital, you're gonna look to see what else you can invest in. Alman invested in insurance. He was um, he, a founder of some of the insurance companies. He invested in banking, Bank of Nova Scotia. He also invested in shipping. And so you see how, how the slave money became diversified in other endeavors. Enos Collins, for example, established the Halifax Bank, which later became the Canadian Imperial Bank of Co Commerce. And I said some of these men had direct, direct connection with Dalhousie University and also with King's College University. Let's move on. I, I just talked about shipping and slavery and provincial development, how um, so much of the money that the ships had to pay in custom duties were used for infrastructural development, um, colonial and provincial infrastructure, infrastructural development. These are duty, 
the monies came from, duties imposed on West Indies trade, um, trade imports. So let's go on. And I, I will summarize by saying, um, as, as Greg mentioned, I embarked on this study. It was a three-year study on Dalhousie's relationship to race and slavery. Dalhousie, the founder of the university, that's the Earl of Dalhousie, George Ramsey, and Dalhousie University itself, its involvement with race, slavery, and anti-Blackness. And out of this huge research endeavor, um, so much, we discovered so many things about Dalhousie, the man who was a certified Afrophobe. He did not like black people and wanted to deport them from the colony, the colony of Nova Scotia. He wanted to send them back into slavery, believe it or not. These would be the refugees of the War of 1812, these people who had fought for the British during the War of 1812 and at the end of the war were taken to Nova Scotia and some went to New Brunswick. Dalhousie did not want them in the colony because he saw the colony as a, a site for the sons of the white race. He saw it as a white man's colony and he sought to deport the black refugees back into American slavery. And, um, and when that he couldn't do that, he literally starved many of them, reneging on the promise that the British had made to support them after the war ended. So that's Dalhousie the man. In terms of the university itself, I'll summarize by saying that we have discovered direct linkages between the founding of the university and the profits of enslavement in the West Indies through the use of the funds from the Castine money that was seized from Castine, Maine, and through the use of the funds from the provincial treasury. Halifax Halifax's merchants and other individuals grew wealthy from their involvement in the West Indies trade. And some of these merchants um, were Dalhousie's, Dalhousie University's early leaders. So thank you very much. And I look forward to the discussion. Well, thank you so very much for that, uh, Afwa. It's, uh, I have to say one of the uh, observations I made as you were talking is uh, we've, we've all heard that phrase the political is personal and personal is political and so on and when you were talking and showing the images of, of the, the barrels I couldn't help but think of your last name Cooper <laughs> Cooper you know, but, <laughs> yes. yeah well but these, <laughs> these connections or indeed you know when you were mentioning um, uh, Saltfish and Aki which by the way saved my life because after graduate school I moved downtown Toronto it was in Parkdale uh, uh, King and Dufferin area and Albert's real Jamaicans food was there and right. I could have I could afford the food as a semi-employed graduate student and uh, and uh, uh, ate it. and I'm thinking of the Netflix special high on the hog in which the the um, the invention and in, inventiveness of African Americans enslaved and then afterwards and and having the lousiest cuts of of, of the hog mm -hmm. and turning them into these delicacies and so it perhaps it's uh, uh, you know uh, uh, something to 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 cheer in a certain sense after the fact that saltfish and uh, and aki has become the national dish of Jamaica if uh, um, even though cod doesn't swim in those waters, it, it shows the resourcefulness and so on. And and of course, your own own last name tied in some way this Cooper barrel making and barrels in the slave trade and so on. I, yeah. I'm thinking as well, um, you know, ideas featured the uh, most recent winner of the Kundal History Prize, a Dutch American author historian named uh, Marjolein Kars, and she wrote a book called uh, um, uh, Blood on the River about the slave trade in. Berbice, now present day Guyana, and nearly didn't have the story to tell at all and stumbled across what you could call trial records of rebelling slaves in an archive in The Hague, and which that was the thread that she pulled on, not unlike the threads that you have been pulling on in this talk so far. All of which leads to me to, to think though, um, or to or to, to wonder, uh, uh, who is it for this kind of history making that this, uh, you know, people in our audience right now, you and I in this conversation are already on the side of those who believe that understanding history is important, necessary, not just as a cultured person or to seem intelligent, but really that cliche, you know, that those who don't know history are condemned to repeat it. Um, 
and we're, we're seeing so much pushback now, uh, so much pushback, whether it's the 1619 podcast project or uh, critical race theory being banned in certain schools, especially in the United States, and so on and so on. But this kind of who is the audience of history right now? It's a big question, uh, one that we've touched on in other conversations, but I just thought I would expand on on uh, on the work that you and other historians are doing and who is it for right now well the first off history is no history is constant it's it's dynamic um today uh 9th february 2022 we are making history we are living history tomorrow what we do today will be history but who history who is it for history is for everybody <clears throat> i mean previously it was the voice of the powerful, the you know politicians, captains of industry, their their voice, their concerns. Um, those were the the voices that made it in the in the history books, that made it in courses, that made it in the curriculum. And as I was uh, saying earlier, uh, with to to you, Greg, um, in in the past 50, 70 years, we have the voice of shall I say the subaltern speaking out. Mm-hmm the 1619 project, the uh, my investigations into Lord Dalhousie's relationship to race and slavery. Um, we are, we, we've had the history of the great men, Lord Dalhousie and others, John E. McDonnell and others. No, it's, we're looking from the bottom up. We're looking on the ground. We're saying, what about the people who's, who, um, whose blood, sweat and tears helped to establish this institution in the case of Dalhousie University. Who are they? Um, black slaves in the West Indies. What did they do? How, how, was money, how did they create this wealth? How did they create this, this, the, 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 this revenue to give birth to this August institution? So it's another take on history. History is multifaceted. It has many sides. And what I'm doing and others are doing it is, is to bring some of these facets, is to highlight some of these stories uh, and to amplify some of these voices so we get a rounder picture. It's not like we're going to get the full or total picture. That's why I say it's ongoing. It's dynamic. Um. Uh, I would like with all my heart to believe what you've just said, and clearly I do, otherwise I wouldn't be here or work on a program like Ideas. The reason I say that in a slightly, you know, puckish way is that are are we, I guess the question is, are we, as it were, preaching to the choir? In other words, that there are a lot of forces outside of the academy, outside of outside of the liberal bourgeois elite, if you, if you, if you like, uh, where they... Um, and even inside to to one degree or another where yes it's you know if if you are in the tent as it were uh recuperating lost suppressed histories is paramount um there are many people that don't want to hear it or dispute it you know i was shocked recently to learn how ignorant um in the, and that's not a, a value judgment i just mean it descriptively how unaware many people across different demographics are of the holocaust and if I, I would have thought if there's one story from the 20th century that's that's in danger of being overplayed uh, it might be the, and it's not true the level of knowledge is is uh, uh, e- even on a the when and the where and the what uh, is 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 remarkably low so i, I guess um uh the question is who is it for another way of putting it is um, is history in danger of being ignored or commandeered right now in a way that it was not when uh, you or, or I, for that matter, were coming up uh, in, uh, in secondary and post-secondary education? Are, are we in a kind of inflection point now, a kind of I, crisis? I think, I think perhaps people in academia have to take some, some of the blame because for the longest while we have, you know, history, say as a discipline, um, not necessarily as a practice, you know, was in this ivory tower. I talked about the great man history and then the, the great women's history. So let's look at something like the, the women's studies in the university system. That came from the streets. Women's studies came out of grassroots movement, protest, mobilization, demonstration. It entered the academy and it sort of became an, an elitist kind of situation where people engage in you know, massive theorizing and 
and um obfuscative language yeah, and, and recondite and language terminology that, that, you know that's really ob yeah exactly so it seems that sometimes when things enter the ivory tower or when certain disciplines are promoted in the ivory tower they get the life sucked out of them um and so it's left up to all of us to create histories and stories that are accessible to everyone and that's why the heritage institution so for example in canada we have parks canada these public institutions um, um are, are necessary because not everybody's gonna go to the university of toronto or whichever university and take a degree right. in history or in humanities it's just not gonna happen so when you have um public institutions like say parks canada or other um, I can think of um, the others. It, it, it's important. Um, a radio, TV, the ideas program, um, documentaries, the the <laughs> plackings, all of these have to be brought <laughs> brought into I know, the service I know. Yeah. of history. So yes. Well, it's impossible not to in, embed oneself in this in this particular question, but and I'm glad that you've mentioned that because I think the professionalization of academic vocabularies is is something that really needs more scrutiny than it has received. Uh, I have to say, my own uh, background is literature, yours obviously being history, um, and I and I think and much of the skepticism that value judgments um, that every truth itself and so on are really the results of discourses of power ultimately rhetoric of power that there's no uh that objective truth is not realizable and so on and so on leaving huge swathes of territory to be claimed by an increasingly ugly right where now i would argue political conservatism is unrecognizable what it had been decades earlier with this hardening and, and, and radicalizing people, exactly and if people don't if people feel alienating alienated from you know certain discourses um then they're gonna feel like mm, these people are making me feel stupid you know that is i'm so glad that you said that i'm sorry to interrupt but you just hit a nerve there and i'm wondering and and uh uh and i should probably let people watching this know that you and i have talked a little bit about the point i'm about to raise um in in previous conversations and you know I wonder if part of the mainstream and some of the pushback against the kind of history that you do, whether it's or 1619 or, or programs such as the one I run in this anti-elitism, is, um, is, is the, is, has there been a problem with the kind of examinations um, that you undertake, for example, and are people receiving the message that you don't want to make? On the one hand, I believe what you're trying to say, this is the history, we need to be aware of these connections and, and that Dalhousie University in this specific instance is, is tied to the operations and legacy of racism. Uh, but the unintended message is that uh, I am a bad person listening to this, uh, uh, that, that Dalhousie is bad, that everything, that there's a kind of finger wagging or moralizing Un unintended or intended in some instances. I've encountered this in public events that I've attended as part of uh, the program Ideas, where a guy stood up in Oakville, where I happen to live, an older gentleman, but said, why has this panel discussion said nothing good about Canada? And it, and it really wasn't about the virtues of Canada, but, uh, but, that, but his response was visceral. Do you know what I mean? Like, is the messaging no, I, somehow- I, I, yeah. I know what you mean, absolutely. And that is because, Greg, in in many ways we're kind of just starting the conversation let's say when i said just starting i mean over the past 30 years no, or historically maybe, yeah. yeah or maybe um institutions are just no willing to open up if we think of okay the the murder of mr george floyd in may 2020 that really opened up a space and i i do believe we have to build a statue for george floyd because after that brutal event institutions corporations banks you name it everybody's saying oh you know we want to support the black community and we want to have these dialogues we want to have edi initiatives in place and so on so for the really for the first time you have uh, many powerful institutions and people perhaps willing to listen so it's not as so this is in a way for the first time 
this dialogue has been given a kind of space and hopefully that space lasts. And so people are gonna feel defensive, not because anyone is say, hey, you're a bad person, but because it's sort of the first time we've been having these conversations. Sure, we had the civil rights movement in the 60s, but that was also hijacked by conserv conservatism, by right-wing politics, by certain politicians, right? And the massive assassinations or the numerous assassinations that happened then to steal that movement. So this conversation is really in its infancy and some people are gonna be upset. But at the same time, if you think of how um, black people, people of color, have um, suffered as a result of racial oppression and discrimination, then I would say it's okay for people to feel uncomfortable. It's okay for some people to feel upset because, you know, um, speaking of the black community, <laughs> we have been uncomfortable for three, 400 years in this hemisphere. And, and so people have to be willing to hear, maybe they won't listen, We'll have to be, hear some uncomfortable truths because why should we not tell the story of the slaves? Why should we not tell the story of what they did to build this society and to build institutions of higher learning from which they and their descendants were excluded? That's kind of like the rub too. That's, that's the rub, you know? So my efforts, my energy, my blood, sweat and tears went into um, literally building, as in constructing um, this place, um, providing the income for to hire the professors and, and so on. But yet I cannot enter into these ho hollowed halls. I can't even go through the gate as a student. I must be there as a maid, as a gardener, as a cook. So even at the school I'm talking about, Dahouse University, it wasn't a space that was open to black people or their descendants or, or, or would necessarily welcome them. And so people are going to be uncomfortable, but I say, let them be uncomfortable. I think that is an appropriate way to end this part of the, uh, of the dialogue and our, our conversation right now, Afwa. Thank you. So, and in fact, hearing your voice reach its animated uh, uh, peaks in that um, last answer that you gave, I, I, I was, strangely or not strangely, my mind went to a Seamus Heaney poem, uh, the, uh, the Cure of Troy, uh, where at one point the speaker in the poem, let's call it Seamus Heaney, but the speaker of the poem is despondent that don't hope on this side of the grave. And later on, but the great tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. So thank you for rhyming history with us right you're, now. You're most welcome. Thank you very much. So now I will turn over the conversation, uh, a group conversation, group discussion to Remy Warner, uh, who is the director of the Human Rights Services at what used to be called Ryerson University and is also uh, a senior fellow at Massey College. Remy. Thank you, Greg and Natalie for the Indigenous Land Acknowledgement and Dr. Cooper for your acknowledgement of our shared, indeed collective debt to our African ancestors. As Greg mentioned, my name is Remy Warner, and I will be joining and moderating today's discussion with Camille Orich and Nicole M. Foafo McCarthy. And they and we together will be discussing the excellent presentation today by Dr. Afua Cooper. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Cooper uh, is unable to join us for a live discussion this time around, uh, but we are hoping to have her back soon for an open uh, Q and A, so look forward to that. By way of introduction, Camille Orich is a quadrangle member of Massey College and a senior fellow of the Wellesley Institute. She has a career in healthcare that spans over 50 years in her roles as CEO of the Toronto Community Care Access Centre and the Toronto Central Local Health Integration Network. Camille has worked within all levels of the healthcare system to improve the access experiences and outcomes of Toronto's diverse populations. Welcome to you. Camille. Um, also, Nicole, we have with us is a second year medical student at the University of Toronto. She is a recipient of the National Terry Fox Humanitarian Scholarship. Congratulations to you and was recently awarded, wow, the Rhodes Scholarship in November 2021. 
Uh, Nicole is a junior fellow at Massey College, where she serves as an advisor on the Anti-Black Racism Committee. So a warm welcome to uh, both of you. Uh, so before opening up uh, the floor, I'll begin by offering some of my uh, you know, tentative reflections. <clears throat> and I think part of what I found uh, fascinating about the story Dr. Cooper shared with us today is the ways in which it uncovered and revealed the university as a central site, benefactor and propagator of the colonial slavery political economic order. And while this story may seem somewhat novel, or unique on first take in directly implicating the university and its founder in the transatlantic slave trade economy, I think it would be a mistake to posit this imbrication as anomalous. For if we zoom out for a moment, as does Dr. Cooper in several occasions, with the ocular aid of such decolonial theorists as Franz Fanon, Eric Williams, C.L.R. James, or Silvio Winter, to name a few, it becomes possible to at once trace and connect the very edifice, foundation, and ascendancy of the entire modern Western European world order as a creation of the dark world, as W.E.B. Du Bois famously put it, not only materially through the stolen land, labor, and raw materials, but intellectually and conceptually as Europe and its white controlled colonies came to define themselves against this very self-same so-called barbaric, uncivilized and dark other. Indeed, universities all over the colonized and Europeanized world played and continue to play, uh, however much liberal and postmodern in some cases, uh, a critical and central role in the propagation of the idea and mythology of white supremacy and of Europe as the land of the elevation of the particular to the universal, as Hegel famously put it, where the light of reason somehow escaped the dark grasp of the dark ages and the dark races to see things as they truly are from the perch of this all-seeing Western eye. The establishment of new schools and universities and settler colonies with this newly minted white canon frequently followed closely in the destructive wake of the cannonball cannons as described and chronicled by the Nigerian American scholar, philosopher and religious studies scholar, Oludamini Ogunaiki, securing ever more securely and effectively the reproduction of colonial relations of domination and subjugation, such as distinguished the human from the less than human, those with history who know and those without who don't. As Fanon observes of this radical original historical revisioning Colonialism is not satisfied merely with the holding a people in its grip and emptying the native's brain of all form and content. By a kind of perverse logic, it turns to the past of the oppressed people and distorts it, disfigures, and destroys it. Apprehending the existential threat posed by this intellectual reordering of history and knowledge, the African-American historian and often named father of Black history and this is Black History Month after all, Carter G. Woodson presently, presciently warned at the launch of Negro History Week in 1926, and of course this would go on to become Black History Month, that if a race has no history, it has no worthwhile tradition. It becomes a negligible factor in the thought of the world, and it stands ever in danger of being exterminated. The African diasporan must therefore remake his past uh, to paraphrase Alfonso Schomburg, in order to make his future, indeed to have a future worth striving for at all. And it was precisely to counter and rectify such erasures of black humanity and agency in historical thought and contemporary relations that Black History Month was created on the tailwinds of the Harlem Renaissance as part of a broad political, economic, cultural, and intellectual movement and pushed to, among other things, create the necessary conditions and alternative institutional structures, including beyond the academy, importantly, that could make possible Black scholarly study of history by Blacks who are able to think Black, to quote Woodson against the monotonous white grain. Woodson, like CLR James, was well aware that the growth of such Black studies would require a complete reorganization of the intellectual life and historical outlook of the United States, to which we could add Canada, and world civilization as a whole, to quote James. It is against this larger backdrop of citizens and subjects, sugar and salt fish 
disciplines and disciplinary moves that I'm most gratified to see the same historical uh, recon reconciling happening on our own home on native land. Thanks today to Dr. Afua Cooper for any meaningful future uh, that is the decolonizing of these lands and institutions, including our institutions of higher learning, will most certainly depend on this effort. Uh, so I, having uh, shared and set uh, somewhat of a, a broader canvas uh, for today's discussion, I'd now like to give my uh, co-panelists an opportunity to uh, respond to Dr. Afua Cooper's lecture with their own thoughts and reflections. Um, and, you know, to is there anything in particular that resonated or stood out for you in Dr. Cooper's presentation today? Um, uh, Camille, we, we can begin with you and, and then Nicole, over to you. Yeah, the, the place that I um, wanted to start from is the place about discomfort. And there's a lot mm -hmm. of people that are uncomfortable at this time with these conversations mm -hmm. going on. But the reality for us is that we have lived this life for generations. And mm -hmm. it's not only history for us. It is today. Mm -hmm. It is current. Our children mm -hmm. are ex having some of the same experiences um, of racism mm -hmm. as uh, that led to enslavement of our people. And the piece that I just mm -hmm. wanted to um, point out is not only in the university, that's part of it, but it's also, it's as if we and our kids now should feel grateful to be able to access and get entry into these places. And so you go in and you get this feeling, people are thinking, isn't it wonderful that you're here? Aren't you grateful that we're allowing you in? And you just kind of want to roll your eyes and say, are you kidding me? <laughs> we built this. This was built on our backs. And so for me, that's the value of moving this from history to now, because it's the same mm -hmm. thread. It's the same, mm -hmm. you know, some things have changed, but not much have changed in terms of that inbred, ongoing oppression and lack of value, lack of access. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. those were the things that for me, um, bringing that from, the past to now, because people have a perception that that's history. The Holocaust mm -hmm. is history. Except mm -hmm. we, have, we have heard what happened in the school system. Recently, mm -hmm. here in Toronto, we have seen what's happening with the blockades. And that kind of racism and dissent is not history. It's current. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I um, liked the, um, just that linkage. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. Uh, so, Nicole, welcome your, your thoughts and remarks, and if anything in particular stood out for you. Yeah, um, so one thing that stood out for me to begin with was the discussions of how um, we might be, as Canadians, and as Can in Canadian history, we have been able to distance ourselves from um, the act of slavery in itself, although historically incorrect, we've been able to distance ourselves and position ourselves as the place of a place where runaway slaves could come and feel safe but i think it's very i think this i think dr cooper's work really highlights the idea that although we might be able to distance ourselves through law and legislation from the act of slavery itself we were still positioned to enjoy its fruits and the benefits and the production that came from slavery and not only did we enjoy these fruits but we enabled these fruits to plant seeds in our institutions um, and these seeds then continue to bear more fruit. And then that's what we notice to be what we consider now to be systemic racism. And the importance of acknowledging that um, a lot of times these institutions, though they are able to transform themselves, if we are not intentional about that transformation, they just reposition themselves to cause the same harm, but in a different way. Um, and that's really important to hold on to and to keep in mind when we talk about transformation or reconciliation is the idea that we are not just hoping to see a new form of an old evil, but rather we're hoping mm -hmm. to see healing and change and a shift in those in those spaces. Absolutely. As uh, I think recently I heard a talk by, uh, again, Dr. Oludumini Ubunaiki, where he said, you know, observing trends and the new attention to EDI in the post-secondary sector, that, you know, sometimes it seems that everything is changing just a little bit in order to keep everything exactly the same. <laughs> 
right? <laughs> and that might be a pessimistic take, but um, it is uh, that, that resonated somewhat uh, for me. And so I'd like to return to the question really that um, Greg had posed, you know, who is this history for? But perhaps more squarely, why uh, does this history matter to us today? And you've both touched on it um, in, way, in, in various ways in your, in your opening remarks. Uh, you know, you often hear today in response, for instance, to calls for reparations. Um, and I, I, I do see reparations as a logical next step and discussion point in this conversation. So hopefully we'll have a part two that actually gets there. Uh, but, um, you know, you often hear in response to such calls that, you know, we need to look forward, not backwards. And, you know, what, what would you say to that? And, and why does this sort of historical recovery that uh, Dr. Afua Cooper is, you know, facilitating uh, important to, to all of us uh, to, today? Nicole? <laughs> sure, I can start off. Um, I think the importance of history is that you need to know what you're looking forward to or where you're trying to go. Um, and that, mm -hmm. of course, I think it came a bit in the talks that the idea that those who aren't aware are at risk of history repeating itself. Um, but more so, I think that it's the trajectory that we want. And if you want the trajectory to be a complete um, 180, that's a situation where we need to understand where have we been and where are we trying to go, including mm -hmm. considering what are the experiences of individuals and what have those experiences been like? What have been the tactics that have been used in the past? And I do agree that the, the discomfort that we're seeing is that a lot of people are either hearing this for the first time or they're, and because it's their introduction to a more complete history or a different perspective, they haven't had that general ge generational time to consider it and sit with it. So we're seeing that the ways in which marginalized communities have had generations um, to manage and navigate themselves through these difficult spaces to the, the generations to discuss with their, their children and their children about what to experience and what to foresee and what has happened and what might happen again that has not happened on the other side in the same ways. Therefore, that mm -hmm. leads to this very new and fresh discomfort with, without those tools to navigate those spaces. However, I think it's also really important that we recognize that it is not on, it's not the responsibility of marginalized communities to help people with their discomfort. Mm -hmm. While there is room for increased conversation, we have to be very mindful of who we put at task to resolve certain things. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, yeah, if, whose vantage point is being being privileged, right? And who, who, who are we catering to? And so thank you for, for drawing out that uh, critical point. Um, as I, Camille. Yeah, I think um, the, this is particularly of value to us and our people and our children. You know, you have kids, black kids, indigenous kids growing up in Canada that uh, have not had any of this information. They will get it from their families, but in some cases dismiss it as, uh, you know, just my immigrant mom who came from the old country with these stories because it's nowhere in their education, in their school system. And so I think it's important for all kids to have this history, but I think for us at this time, it really is important for our children to know and um, strengthen their foothold and their grounding and the strength to take their legitimate place in this society to be able to demand their own rights and access um, to all the institutions and not in the old sense but when you enter to also demand change and be part of that change in those institutions mm -hmm. by bringing all of this with you because you can't rely that um, the powers that be have had this education. So, mm -hmm. and it's not our job, as Nicole said, to do that education. But when we stand solidly in it, we can refer them. We can say, you need to go do your work. Um, right, but I am yes. now solidly here. You're not doing me any favors. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think th for me, that's one of the key value in some of this work move um and as professor said a lot of the things we are achieving didn't come out of the academia and the university <laughs> the mm -hmm. biggest advancement came from grassroots yeah. from activism from us from our children etc mm -hmm. 
So I think this is just another form of the value here is that equipping ourselves and our children with this knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. And, and, you know, it struck me in just reading more about the history of Black History Month that, you know, Carter, Carter G. Woodson, and of course, we don't want to just replicate big men in history and you now with big black men in history. Of course, he was part of a broader movement of the Har Harlem Renaissance um, and, and broader social forces of black consciousness. Um, but it was, you know, he spent time in the ac academy and came to the conclusion that, it, you know, it just was not a place uh, for, for him and he swore never to return. Uh, in, in 1922 and, and committed himself to really building alternative structures. And, you know, and he created this organization for the study of, of, uh, of black life and history. That is the organization, you know, together with its journal of, at that time, Negro History Journal of Black History. Um, you know, he created these alternative institutions precisely and with a focus on disseminating, you know, this knowledge in the educational system, right? Uh, reaching out to, to, to the younger uh, generation, precisely as you said, Camille, um, in the spirit of uh, this needed self-transformation, right? And when you look at the 1970s, when, look, it took us from 1926, when we had Black History Week, to 1970, now you have Black History Month at Kate Stent University, right? And it's the Black, you know, Students United who brought that forward, uh, you know, before it was recognized, you know. But what's 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 next, right? And I think, sorry, Rimi, what's I next in the evolution? To... Come in. What's yeah, next? I just wanted to just also point out that um, the the value of Dr. Cooper's work and some of our, the black academics, people doing history, doing activism, is there is a mm -hmm. tendency in for, of us here in Canada to look so, so hard at the US that we yeah, don't know true. our own history. There Me have too. been activism in Canada, in Toronto. You know, I remember in the 70s, mm -hmm. the demonstration um mm -hmm. coming out of Krista Pitts about police yes. brutality and violence here in Toronto. So it's and the, you know we have had black people in Alberta in Saskatchewan. Um yes. you yeah, know absolutely it's time yeah. for us as Canadians to actually focus on Canadian history, can what um what has happened here so that we mm -hmm. then lose this self-righteousness that you get so often, we're better than them. It's happening there, not here. Not and here, I think yes. we do yes. ourselves a disservice as Canadians when we participate in that, that dialogue or have the focus so, you know, having so much focus mm -hmm. on the US and not on us. And I think this kind mm -hmm. of work and dialogue f pushes us to do our own soul searching, because I think that's the only way we're mm -hmm. going to actually make change and get better, is to dismiss yes. this notion that we're better, it didn't happen here, it's not happening here. Yeah. <laughs> because yes, those yes, of us right? who live here know that's absolutely not true. Yes, uh, absolutely, and thank thank you for, for that reminder. And that's part of the beauty of, of, of Professor Cooper's intervention is that it, it situates Canada and imbricates it in wider transatlantic relations, right? So I think that's part of the balance, right? Not to lose sight of our situatedness. And many of those histories still have not been written, uh, as you mentioned, right? Um, but to also not be so local that we fail to see the ways in which the global, you know, and the Atlantic world has shaped our particular um, experiences. I wonder if you, uh, you know, either of you would uh, be able to share perhaps any more um, intimate or close experiences, um, you know, in terms of how this history of dehumanization has shaped and reverberated, you know, in your respective fields of study, work, and inquiry. Um, you know, I know we've we've spoken about it in, in an abstract manner uh mostly um as this affects us and our children but 
I don't know if you have any uh, personal an anecdotes that you would be willing to share. And if not, I understand and respect your, yeah, your decision for, otherwise. Yeah. For me, it's not even a willingness. I would just say, just look at yesterday's report that came out of the Canadian nurses, the RNA, the black nurses in yes. Canada, in Toronto. Yeah. You don't need to go any further. It's right. all there. It's current. It's today's experience. It's what these highly qualified folks are living with today. Um, not with the institutions themselves discriminating against them, but their experience with their colleagues and their mm -hmm. experience about how they see fellow black people are treated when they enter healthcare. So, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. just get that report and look at it. I think it just says mm -hmm. it all. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Nicole, anything you'd like to add? I know we're getting yeah. down to the, our conclusion here. We're a little past five now. Yeah, um, I think, well, like closer to the conclusion, what I would say is that I was really fortunate um, during the early May 2021 protests, I think it was 2020, to see um, the importance of language and how, mm -hmm. and how it is important. And I think alluding earlier to what Camille was mentioning about why it's so important that it's not just for us to teach others before ourselves, um, and to have the experience that, you know, children didn't have to wait or don't or, or through these through increased resources they may not have to wait until you university like i i did to be able to name certain experiences that they now have mm -hmm. access to resources that allow them to say you know what what i've experienced is real um, and not only is it real but it's a common experience and there's a common thread here um, and that kind of mm -hmm. lets you know that you're not alone and it lets yes. it allows you to find that strength in community so i think um, the mm -hmm. importance of history, not only looking at it as, as a tool for others to learn about us, but a way for us to learn about each other in our communities, mm -hmm. to pull mm -hmm. from each other and to lean on mm -hmm. each other. And through that understanding, we can gather the tools to do what we need to do to keep each other safe and whole in this world. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nicole. And that's that's precisely where I wanted to bring it to a closure with uh, any you know signs of optimism and hope uh, that you see in the current moment uh, you know and any thoughts on what it might take to sustain such optimism and 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 momentum if indeed you do see this just to end on a, on a more of a positive uh, note i i must say i'm totally energized i look at nicole that generation the young yeah. folks and i Ooh. you know they have it going on and they what i see is the they're working across other isms they're working across patriarchy they're working across mm -hmm. homophobia they are working with indigenous folks they understand the disservice that has happened to indigenous folks in this country mm -hmm. and so when i look across the work that i see young people are doing and how they're joining together and how they're articulating the change that's required it, it, you know, it gives me a lot of hope. Because um, mm -hmm. I'm from the generation where, you know, we did thing around um, civil rights, but the women were left out. We did work in the women's movement, but black and indigenous women were left out. We did work in the gay movement, but black <laughs> and transgender people were left out. I look at Black Lives Matter. I look at all the other work I see happening and I see folks working on all those issues and mm -hmm. calling anti-Black racism for what it is. You know, stop mm -hmm. talking about equity and diversity um, mm -hmm. because that moves us along, but it still leaves us Black and Indigenous people behind. And people are just yes. saying, no, not anymore. Let's call anti-Black racism what it is. And so I see the youth having that language, as Nicole um yes. says using it embracing it and it makes me feel hopeful mm. thank you thank you and nicole anything you would like to to add there's a nice connection there between your, your um i think now. that as like as the youth we're, we're we're trying to pull on our resources i think for us we have to thank a lot of trailblazers who came before us and made that path yes. a lot easier and a lot smoother and i think the opportunity to be in a time where you can look up and see people in higher positions that look like you that are willing to reach out to you and speak to you and mentor you um it's mm -hmm. incredible and i think it does such a good service to what we're trying to do and i think that 
Um, we owe a lot of our work, a lot of our space to those who have come before us. And we really just hope to do our best to honor them and to on, on, honor people in those spaces. Mm, well, thank you so much, uh, both of you, for your thoughtful comments and, and engagements. And, you know, next time, uh, hopefully we can have Dr. Cooper with us live and, and, and entertain uh, questions from, from, from our audience today. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining. Um, and I think I'll just end with an, a, a short anecdote, because I promise that we wouldn't go past 515. And Camille, I know you've got a dinner date coming up. But... <laughs> and Camille, by the way, is uh, went to high school or the same high school as uh, Dr. Cooper. So it's so amazing. There's so many sort of uh, confluences there to, to discuss. Um, but, you know, part of this project um, that I think we're, we're all striving to be engaged in, but certainly Dr. Cooper uh, with this presentation today is, is providing, as she said, you know, you know, different vantage points uh, with which to understand, right? And a language of you, as both Camille and Nicole have said, a language with which to grasp you know, what is before us, right? The task in, in, in front of us. And as, as part of uh, you know, shifting vantage points, I mean, you know, we really want to move to a, a pluriverse of, you know, we have a, we have a university, well, uh, a pluriversity of, of visions and standpoints and perspectives um, is very much needed at this historical time. And uh, uh, to provide one anecdote, um, that I found very interesting when I was I was talking recently uh, to a friend um, and who had mentioned, now I'm born in Dakar, Senegal. And there's, a, there's a whole story about why that is the case. My father uh, went to school in France at the University of Cannes and you know uh, wasn't able to study what he was uh, particularly interested in, this, the, the literature of independence, the uh, M.A. César, the Negritude movement, and so he went and once he did get tenure as a professor, you know, completely shifted fields and, and hence my birth in Dakar, Senegal. And in Dakar, Senegal, you know, the, 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 the Muslim faith uh, is, is predominant there. And, uh, you know, people are uh, predominantly a part of the um, what's called the Tijani Tariqa, right, which is like a, a Sufi order of sorts. And a friend uh, from there was recently telling me how the 18th century a sheikh and spiritual leader who founded this Tijaniya Tariqa, which is dominant all over, all over West Africa, um, had prohibited uh, the consumption of processed sugar uh, based on a, on a vision he had had. And he had stated uh, that processed sugar is forbidden to eat or sell. It has been confirmed to me that it is mixed with blood. And, and so it just hearing today uh, that remark, right? How literally, I mean, not, not, not metaphorically, right? Dr. Cooper mentioned this, um, you know, literally it was mixed with blood. And I think uh, Camille and Nicole, I, I, I would have taken you out for Aki and Saltfish after this to thank you for your participation, but I'm having second thoughts as much as that's, that's one of my favorite dishes. And, Mine too. Uh, was, right? <laughs> Um, but yeah, again, you know, thank you so much um, for your thoughtful uh, engagement today. And I look forward to ongoing conversations in the rest of this month here at Massey College. So and thank you uh, to everyone. And of course, to our uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Afua Cooper. Uh, good, good, good night, everyone.